Now Lauren will bring us our first scripture. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilha and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. He had another dream, and he told it to his brothers, saying, Look, I have had another dream. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What kind of dream is this that you have had? Shall we indeed come, I and your mother and your brothers, and bow to the ground before you? So his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, here I am. So he said to him, go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. Sorry, we continue in Genesis chapter 37, beginning at the 18th verse. They, his brothers, saw him from a distance, and before he came near them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not take his life. Reuben said to him, to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to their father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way down to carry it to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he's our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silverware. Silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A friend had a habit of making a distinction between on one hand a vacation and on the other hand a family trip. 
when her three teenage boys went along for the ride, it was definitely a family trip. And here, when Joseph and his brothers bring their sheep to Shechem and then to Dotar, it is definitely a family trip. In this detailed and horrifying story, family dynamics play out at their most human. It's all here. A father favoring one child over another. Check. Sibling rivalry. Check. Faulty decision making. It's all here. These brothers, these 12 brothers who become the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel, the ones who are to inherit God's promises, they display just about every imaginable family dysfunction. I mean, talk about the sins of the fathers being passed on to generation after generation. Favoring one child over another was pr practically a genetic inheritance in this family. Jacob, the father of the 12, favored Joseph, probably because Joseph's mother, Rachel, was Jacob's favorite wife. And then Jacob's mother, Rebecca, favored him, while his father, Isaac, favored his twin brother, Esau. And going back another generation, Isaac's mother, Sarah, insisted that Abraham favor her offspring over those of Hagar and Ketubah, his later wives. And we see the ripple effect of all those generations playing out here in the story of Joseph. Because the Midianite and Ishmaelite traders who take Joseph out of the pit and bring him down to Egypt are the offspring of Hagar and Ketubah. Favoritism is at the root of much misbehavior in the Bible and in life. Now there's something called family systems theory you may have heard of. It's applied sometimes to families, but also to churches and other organizations. And one of its tenets is that there are certain roles that individuals play and we tend to stay within those roles that are sort of assigned within the system. We act those roles out again and again in helpful and sometimes not so helpful ways. And these roles can become more complicated in complex families such as this one, where one man fathers 12 brothers through four wives, two of whom are maids to two of the others who themselves are sisters. So what are some of those roles we see in this story? Reuben is the firstborn and he steps right into that role, taking charge saying, no, let's not kill him. Thinking I'm gonna go rescue him and save the day by returning him to our father. But then Judah comes in with his role and he's sort of the, the capitalist of the group. He wants to turn a profit on this. And he wants to sell Joseph to the traders, attempting a sort of end run around Reuben. And, and what about Joseph's role here? Is he just naive? I mean, was he just ignorant of the way the world works? Leaving him at the mercy of his brother's malice? Was he a bit arrogant? I mean, what does he think is going to happen when he tells them this dream where he clearly triumphs over all of them and their father. Maybe he could consider not flouting the father's favor in the form of this coat. We know in the musical, it's called Joseph's amazing technicolor dream coat, but the actual translation is really the coat with either long sleeves or stripes. Joseph's brothers 
sure do behave despicably, but Joseph has his own role to play in the way the events here transpire. And today, when a person or even a nation boasts of God's special favor and is then surprised when others react in anger, we can see the ripples of this story for us. This is also a great example of how hard it is to get 11 people in any family to agree with one another. Plan one is we're gonna kill Joseph and say he was devoured by wild animals. Plan two, Reuben says, no, put him in the pit. I will save the day. Plan three, Judah says, no, let's sell him. Let's sell him and, and keep the money. But then in this really chilling detail, they don't actually do that. They sit down, we presume within earshot of this pit and they have something to eat. And then actually the traders pull Joseph out of the pit and take him down to Egypt where as his father did before him, when he went to Laban, he will bloom where he is planted. Cruelty and deceit in this story don't stop there. Then the brothers take Joseph's tunic and cover it with animal blood and take this symbol of their father's love back to their father and say that Joseph has been devoured by wild animals. And Jacob was devastated, refusing for years to be consoled. This is clearly a case where the cover up is even worse than the crime, horrific as that was. So you're gonna to have to come back next week to find out how this all works out. But for us, from today, we can take this lesson and comfort. In our imperfect family relationships, we can sometimes have strains and even forever separations. Our human frailties can be magnified under a microscope and feuds and hurt feelings and history can win out. But we belong to the family of God, as did those 12 brothers. They were not just in their family of human origin, they were part of the family of God. And so that's good news for the 12 tribes of Israel. And the family of God for them and for us is one in which grace is also passed down from generation to generation. Unmerited favor, God's amazing grace. And we have that not because of what we have done, but sometimes in spite of it. In earthly families, we can never be loved as fully and unconditionally as we sometimes long for. Thank God, God does love us in that way. Only God can do that. And thank God, God does. God loves us and forgives us in all our beauty and dysfunction. We are all invited to come along for the ride of a lifetime and beyond. And together, who knows, we might just be able to turn that family trip into a true vacation. May it be so for us. Amen. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. 
there is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. If you cannot preach like Peter, if you cannot pray like Paul, just tell the love of Jesus who died to save us all. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. Don't ever feel discouraged for Jesus is your friend. And if you lack for knowledge, he'll ne'er refuse to lend. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul.